You're listening to the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show. My name's Neil Butler. Him, the handsome one over there, that is Rob Cameron. And we are delighted to be able to welcome a special guest to the program in our special guest spot. And another one we can land in the Legends of Australian Music Collection. Rob, who have we got? Indeed, we have got uh, Peter Farnan from the aforementioned Is It Boom or Boom Crash Opera. Peter, good morning and welcome. Good morning, handsome Rob. Handsome (laughs) Peter here. Um, yeah, a good face for radio. It's boom, boom. There it's you boom. Go. Yeah, we blame Rex Hunt, who during the I reckon the two thousands, every time there was a crunch in the football, he would go, "There's a bit of boom crash opera." I think that's where it's all gone wrong. <laughs> and and, and, and he, whenever he caught a fish as well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Little did you realise all those years ago when you stopped being a serious young insect, uh, and Rob's looking at me going, what on earth is that about, um, that you would one day have Rex Hunt quoting the name of your band in a football commentary. Uh, yeah, who, uh, we were also big in the Northern Territory news. Whenever there was some pile-up on the highway, they'd, they'd show a shocking photo of a wrecked car and put a boom crash on. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what the first question's going to be, don't you? Where did the name come from? Oh, I knew you. Well, otherwise we don't sound like we're proper DJs. You know, you've got to ask the silly questions, then we get sensible later. I, I found the piece of paper, and I, it's actually posted on Facebook. It's gone up a few times now with the name on it. And I remember the day when the name came up, and I remember who came up with it because I bumped into her a few years ago and said, I think you made it up, the name up. She said, I think it did. So her name was Roxanne. We were in the kitchen of Canning Street, uh, Richard Pleasance's Canning Street house, one of those shared houses where you had to leave the house to go to the kitchen. You know that? Yeah. <laughs> or someone did so you could get in there. Yeah. I've lived in a house where you have to leave to go to the toilet, but not the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the kitchen was separate from the house. So it was, you know, not heated, freezing, boiling. But, you know, great times where we wrote a lot of those original songs. And, and there was just two pages of closely written names and then the very last name, Boom Crash Opera. As if it, there was a couple of operas or booms or something leading to it and then she must have dropped it. It was the last name on the, And so we looked at the list and went, well, that's a pretty good list and we chose another name. <laughs> <laughs> then about three days later we went, actually, that one at the end, that, that's probably better. And so we went with that. So you were you were just workshopping a band name and throwing silly things around, and that's how it got there. Yeah, that's how it got there. Yeah, there's some really shocking names. Boy Meets World was one of them, and there is a band out there called Boy Meets World. So yeah, there is actually. Yeah. The, my favourite band name story is the Bay City Rollers, who who decided, despite being Scottish, they needed to have a name that sounded a bit American, and they decided they were going to be the Something Rollers. So they then got a map of America and threw a dart at it, and where it landed, they chose the biggest, the nearest biggest city. And so there could have been the New York Rollers or the Miami <laughs> Rollers or whatever, but they hit Bay City. Gurky uh, Rollers, maybe. <laughs> uh, many years ago, I was working with a young fellow named David Steele, who finished up being part of Weddies, Weddings Parties Anything, and we were in a wool shed shearing sheep, and he said, we need a band name. What do you reckon, guys? And one of the shearers said, well, your nickname's Diesel. What about Diesel and the Injectors? <laughs> and uh, he said, nah, I don't like the sound of that. They chose Wedding Parties Anything, and then some years later... Who popped up? Mark Lazot. <laughs> Isn't it funny? Mm. These weird things. I mean, I, Mick Thomas is a mate, uh, old Northcote resident from way back. And so when Richard and I were starting Boom Crash Opera, he was starting Widows. You know, he told us, the, and we were sharing gear when we were making demos, and he told us, I'm, st- I'm having a band, I'm starting a band, it's called Weddings Parties Anything. We both sort of went, oh, God, don't have that name. <laughs> Fantastic name. <laughs> We've had uh, Mick on the show, so the officially, and by the way, you are now a friend of the show. Yeah. Because you've been on the show. We, we're very friendly, you know, very open we'll to We'll be friends. friendly with anyone, Pete. That's it. Um, so you were obviously in a band before that, hence the reference to the Serious Young Insect. Where did your musical career start? Well, it started with that band, Serious Young Insect. So up, up the road in Melbourne, there was a big band scene around the Crystal Ballroom in St Kilda. And the bands that came out of that that were obviously Nick Cave, a birthday party, um, Models. The Models were huge in in that scene. Hunters and Collectors, the Serious Young Insects were part of that scene. Hunters used to open for Serious Young Insects, but they blew us off the stage because they were (laughs) good. um, They had a brass section as well. 
the, well, yeah, they gradually accumulated the brass section. The, 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 the fine feature they had in the first year or two of life was, a, was Greg Pirano playing a gas tank. I think everyone came to see the gas tank. <laughs> uh, that, was the, that was the thing. And then they accumulated horn sections and sort of evolved into the monoliths that they now are. Yeah. Pete, I've I'm been fascinated chatting to, to fellows of your ilk, and, and as I said to you off air, we've had the privilege of speaking to many, but I, I grew up in a, in a sporting club world, whether it be footy, cricket, whatever, and, and we did our thing, and and, and you people w- were became heroes because you produced music, but the more I understand it, and you've re- related again this morning, that you're all together, you're all still mates, you do all this stuff together, and you go off on your little bands, but you all come back together, you're probably no different to a to a sporting club environment that I grew up with, except you made um, music and we made runs. I think it's a really interesting analogy that I've never thought of. I always use the analogy of family. It's like family. So not everybody who was in the band in the beginning is in it now. We, uh, so John Favaro plays the bass now. Now, John was in the Bad Love, so he's got his own legend status. And um, Richard Pleasant doesn't play with us anymore. He, his ears are a problem. Greg O'Connor left us only a few years ago. Just, you know, he was getting to the point where his son was entering high school and he wanted to be there. And so we haven't got those two. Ian Tilly was replaced Richard Pleasant. He's no longer with us. But we are all in contact with each other. And occasionally there's a larger Boom Crash Opera ensemble that plays where the others come back. And that's um, that's a, a different piece at all. The sporting club thing is interesting. Um, it's because I say um, that doing a, I'm not a sporty person, but a boom crash opera gig is like going. Uh, you go, oh gosh, I don't think I can do this, and then you run onto the field. Yeah, you run around everywhere. You kick the ball everywhere. You run as fast as you can. You come off stage. You go, oh my god, that was great. Fun. How good was that? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I grew up in uh, in the eastern suburbs of of Melbourne, and so you know the the sort of words that we used to get here thrown around were Donny in Southside Six, Rock at the Croc, Coxie at the Roxy, and those sort of pub that pub circuit. And my recollection was, uh, you know, the in excesses and the mentals and all that lot, sort of the four or five years, seven years earlier than you guys hit the, the market, that they would rotate through the pubs. They'd come to, from Sydney and do six nights in a row at the six different pubs. When you guys started out as Boom Crush Opera, was that still the scene or were, had, the, had the music industry changed a bit? Yeah, that ran through well into the 90s, yeah. six nights a week. You know, you do your six nights a week in Melbourne and then you drive up and do your six nights a week in Sydney. You always drove too. Everything was driving and the difference back then, it's a technical thing, the listeners might be bored by it, but the bands carried their own lights and PA, and PAs were enormous then. They were, you know, with mm. carrying around a couple of large boats. <laughs> and um, so it was an, an enterprise. At one stage, we, we did a tour with uh, Nick Barker and the Reptiles, so there was, they were opening for us, and there was, oh, what, there was nearly 20 people on the road, and there was a semi-trailer, and we're putting it into pubs, all those pubs you said. Mm. You sort of turn up and bung it into into the Ferntree Gully Hotel, and then the next night the Village Green, and then you know, and then it'd be up the road to um, Sydney, be down the road to Geelong, yep. Warren Ponds, or what, what's the one? The, uh, the oh, not the Ozone, the one in Ocean Grove. What was that one? The Caledonia, Col- Colondina, Colondina. That's it. That's it. Yep. Yeah. And, of course, the famous uh, Golf View Hotel, these days known as the Sphinx, where Glenn Shorrock got up on stage once and said, we are no longer Mississippi, we are the Little River Band. Oh, wow, well, there's a story. Which brought the house down because, obviously, they'd seen the name Little River, and you'll see that sign on your way down in the car uh, on the 1st of March. We'll talk more about your visit to town soon. So you guys hit the, the scene, I'm guessing, what, 86, 87, somewhere around about there was the time we first heard of you commercially? Yeah, we started playing in 85, and Great Wall came out early 86. Yeah. And you were sort of everywhere you turned, Boom Crash Opera were there, and I guess having a, a catchy name was, was part of the deal. Um, but then sort of early 90s, things started to you slow down a little for you. Is that how it worked? Well, no, it's, it, was, it was a little bit different because our biggest record was our second album, These Here Are Crazy Times, and that's the one that had the best thing and Onion Skin and the track you played, Dancing in the Storm, mm. uh, Get Out of the House. It was like a string of hits off that one. 
and that that dropped in 90. So touring through 91 and 92 was still big, was actually bigger than it was earlier. Okay. If that makes sense. And there, because we'd kind of, by then we had a string of hits. We had all the hits off the first album and Great Wall and Hands Up. And then we had the string of hits off the second album and then we dropped a third one. So it really didn't start tape, tapering off until 93, 94. But we were still making records. We at The last record we made, we put out in 97, I think. Always helps when you've got a string of hits, though. We, another mate of ours is Mike Rudd, and, and he, he, always, he had a song that he wrote called Play Us One We Know because when they turn up, everyone's wanting to see I'll Be Gone, and you know they have to play for an hour. W- where do you slot that in? But when you've got a string of hits, I suppose it makes it a bit easier. It does. It, 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 you know, Our dream when we started was can we open with a hit and close with a bigger hit? Yeah. And, that was, and we can do that. So when we do a festival slots, we only have to do like 40 minutes, and we just... It's the, the, people know every song, and there, there, there's. We have our second tier, um, air quote hits, mm. songs that people don't realise they know until they hear them. Oh, that's what I remember that one. I remember yep. Diddy Flat, or I remember her charity. And uh, I, I think mental, any, mental as anything were like that too. They could just smash you with hits. You didn't realise how many songs you knew until they played them all in a row. So we're obviously coming to Geelong with uh, our mates in 1927. We're going to hopefully get a chat with Eric at some stage in a few weeks as well. Um, what what happens between 1997 when the, the last record comes out and, and these days? I know Dale's been working with the, is it Everything 80s or Absolutely 80s yeah, group? Well, the, Dale sings through supper, definitely. Yep. This thing. Um, kids, I would say kids. I, I definitely, I, I sort of went, look, I need to slow down and because i'm starting a family i went into theater so i did a lot of I, I was very lucky and just went straight into doing shows for melbourne theater company and malthouse so i went in at a high level can't believe it <laughs> so lucky um maz went to england he played on played on, he's played on every record that moves he's played drums on everything but he went to england worked with natalie and Gurlia, and uh came back here and just played on everything he, you know i'd hire him for sessions by that stage because i was making records with other people and he just come from one other session to our session uh rich richard went into film and tv which he still does if you were a fan of wentworth that's richard's work okay you know he does a lot of work with um the jacobson brothers actually he does all of their films He's plotting something with those boys at the moment. I don't think I'm allowed to say what it is. Though. No. And um, so we are still talking to each other. Have I done everybody? Greg O'Connor was a visual artist, so he can he w- just went back into that. Uh, Ian Tilly went into IT. Who have I left out? Everybody. I think I've covered everybody. Yeah, and if you haven't, uh, no doubt you'll find out in the next <laughs> 20 minutes when someone rings you and says, Oi! <laughs> hey, I was in the band. <laughs> uh, Peter, I want to just go back to your theatre. Fascinating that um the the showmanship stage presence of being a front a band um i imagine for your self-confidence stepping onto a stage to do another form of entertainment would have been the perfect lead-in for your your stage presence you you're talking about me playing in the band or yeah going from the band to you said you went straight into theater oh well i wasn't on stage i was doing sound design and composition oh right yeah, I, pl- I played in the band. I-, I was the musical director for the Sapphires when that the first production of the Sapphires. So I helped sort of put that together. It's a gig I wouldn't get or take these days, being not being you know part of Mob. Yeah, uh, I was re- really lucky to work with Wesley Enoch. So the band were on stage. In fact, John Favaro plays in Boom Crash. He was in that band as well, the first Sapphires band. So, but ju- usually I wasn't on stage. It was, you know, I'd be sitting in the theatre plotting audio levels and doing that sort of thing. Ah, right. So, sorry for that. I thought you'd uh, become a brilliant actor. And you, you, you led him into his best question for probably the year so far. Yeah, it was. And, I was, and it's just going to hit you with like a that. ripper and it's fizzed. It's yeah. fizzed. Work, it works the other way around, if I can interrupt, in as much as I have a strong sense of theatre when the band plays. Of, of uh, what, what's this thing look like? And if Dale's working that part of the room, what should I be doing, you know? So it's I'm fairly aware of that all the time of of how 
you know, how do we make an impact? How do we keep it interesting and fresh as we go? Yes, because unless you're Van Morrison, who is renowned for turning his back on the audience or standing still, um, it's it obviously much more than just the music, isn't it? It's the, the theatre of the event. It definitely, look, it definitely is. And um, Dale's quite aware of it too. But Dale's quite transformed. He's, um, there's something's happened to that boy in the last few years. He's, he's particularly on his game now. Like, he's really tuned into what's going on. It's amazing. You get better as you get older, basically. Oh, there's hope for us yet, then, is there? <laughs> no, it's, it's a sort of a fine line between uh, arrogant and conceited and just stage presence, and I suppose the, the Freddie Mercury's and Robbie Williams of the world um, just nail it every time. And for someone like yourself in a band, it's the music's fine and people come to listen to it, but uh, it, it's the theatrics of the event as well that make the night for people. Yeah, Matt, Maz, our drummer, keeps talking about how he, he says because he played Mark, Maz and John play in Mark Seymour's band as well, and they he, it, Maz says he's realised that with Booncrash Opera, there's there's only one way you can deliver it, and that's you have to play at eleven. You know, you can't you can't undersell it. You have to push this music out, and that's that's part of what energises us. And I, th- you know, I'm really amazed whenever we play. I can't believe how sort of powerful it is like it's you've got to really run and keep up um it's it's quite an experience playing in the band being inside it so i i think an audience enjoys seeing us doing that yeah i guess they want to see you enjoying yourself as well and not just going through the motions yeah, yeah, and we definitely aren't going through the motions, I can tell you. <laughs> I, I must say, I saw Dale performing with um, the a- Absolutely 80s or Everything 80s, whatever it's called, uh, probably 10 years ago, and he was on stage with Ali Fowler and, um, uh, I can see his face, Brian Mannix, and he just got up, and I thought, oh, wow, and, and kind of blew the others away. He, like, he just, uh, Scott Kahn was there as well, and he just, the energy that he performed with was just extraordinary. Yeah, and see, we're better. We're better than that. <laughs> I, well, I think we bring out the best in him because because of that sort of level of delivery. Yeah, it it really puts, if I may be coarse, it puts a rocket up his ass, yes. and it really, you know, it, and um, he lifts our game as well. So it, it it's it's a it's a chemical reaction that can only happen in this band. So. So 1927, I don't uh, associate them with rockets and various parts of the anatomy. They're more your uh, ballady kind of guys. They're uh, performing with you on this event. Is it, you know, Boom Crash Opera one half, 1927 the other, or is there a mixture? How does it all work? Uh, it, it, we, we do our set, they do it, their set. Now, we haven't talked about com- com- combining anything. But, uh, yeah, so distinct sets. I mean, they've got... Well, they've got a string of hits as well, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, absolutely, they have, yeah. I mean, that, that's what these double bills, because this is the second one we've done, we, we just think it's a better night out for everybody because you just go, oh, I'm going to know all these songs rather than just one band and then some support act that you don't know. And, and with respect, uh, you know, you're, you guys are probably now moving into your mid-40s, he said, winking, um, that, uh, you know, having... A full-on two-hour show is probably hard work, doing it four or five nights in a row. It is. They're starting to get longer again. I mean, because we're in the opening spot, we can't go too long. But I have noticed, and this is what I'm the thing with Dale. You know, Dale used to, we'd get up there and he'd, he'd start saying, let's cut that this one as we're playing. And these days, he's kind of wanting, well, I want to do that song. Mm. I want to do that one. And uh, it's going the other direction. So. Well, the good news is you're up first. So if you're still going three hours in 1927, don't get a look in. Yeah, well, it's bad. It's very poor form to do that for a minute. <laughs> if, if it ever happens to you, you stand at the side of the stage with your arms folded going, you've gone over. <laughs> yeah, actually, Big Tom is in the next studio to us for at 12 o'clock, uh, 11 o'clock. He's uh, very much the same. He doesn't like us doing that. No. Yeah, yeah. So you're down here on the 1st of March, and uh, as you say, it's going to be hits back to back to back. Um, where can people get tickets? Oh, well, you've sprung that one on me. You like that? Okay, we'll find out where people can get tickets, but what can they expect on the t- on the night? Well, they can expect this back-to-back hits thing. That's what we wanted to do. We want to give people... An, uh, uh, look, the other thing I really like about the Wool Exchange is that's a really good room. Like We played there, played there about six months ago. It's got a really good stage, and it's sort of got good viewing 
vantage point. So it's quite a, you know, the audience are quite up close and kind of around you. Mm. So it's, um, I, you know, it's the whole idea is giving people a good value night out. Uh, who inspired a young Peter Farnan? Oh, gosh. Look, it's a pretty boring answer. It's the, the Beatles. Remember the Beatles? Some, somebody made a cartoon show about the Beatles, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I remember, it was called the Beatles, as I recall. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and that that I sort of that that chord at the start of a hard day's night is kind of like a bell going off yeah. in my brain. You know, it sort of triggers. It's it's triggering. <laughs> well, I was at Marvel Stadium on the twentieth of October last year, and an old fellow, eighty two year old bloke, came out on stage, and the crowd went nuts, and then they went quiet, and he went, "Dunning," <laughs> and that was the start. And for the next three hours, he just rolled it out. Yeah, yeah, quite incredible. I was there too. I didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they are they are amazing, and the in- influence uh, they have has been quite extraordinary. And uh, were you in a, a music family that uh, also assisted you to do that, or did you just get a passion and then go and find some way to release it? No, I was. Uh, there was piano in the house. Uh, my sister's a singer. Dad was bashing that thing every night, playing all those tunes that I used to turn my nose up and <laughs> I quite like and and I think that was a really important thing you know I've got a I've got uh air quotes again perfect pitch so I can play anything I hear and I think it's by from being drilled in all those tunes that the yeah. uh the the great uh the great American songbook all those Jewish writers who came over and and bleated with jazz and with what African Americans were cooking up you know, I love The Sunny Side of the Street. It's a corny song, and I love it. And, of course, you haven't mentioned your brother, Johnny Farnan. <laughs> <laughs> Great period there. <laughs> thank you thank you for brother, because it, it, I went for father for a while. Yeah. No, well, I, we, you know, we've got to do those sorts of things, don't we? Now, Peter, when I next hear someone ask you the question, what's been your influence in movies, uh, in music, I expect you to say The Beatles and My Dad. And My Dad. Oh, isn't that lovely? What? Well, my... Did you know Rob's dad as well? <laughs> this is getting confusing. <laughs> no, I think he knows what I meant oh, because sorry. inadvertently uh, your dad banging away there was probably be very influential. Yeah, I think it was. So if we jumped in the car with you right now and metaphorically put a C- played the CD that's in your CD player that you don't have in a car anymore, what would be here? Gosh, look, this is a quirky one. I think I'm mellowing in my old age. I've been This week I've been listening to the Punch Brothers there you go. I've lost you there, haven't I? You have. You have. The Punch Brothers play all acoustic instruments virtuosically. And wow. Astonishing songs. Really complex and really dense stuff. It's quite incredible. Well, we've now got... The people at the streaming surface are going to wonder why on earth the Punch Brothers have suddenly just gone berserk <laughs> um, and, and why no one's playing the... That lady who's playing at the MCG today, yeah. which we're not naming on this program, you understand today. Yeah, I don't. I don't think she needs our assistance. No, no you're probably right. Not at all. You might get see if you can get the Punch Brothers into next week's music theme on the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show, Neil. I'll see what I can do. Uh, Peter Farnham, we do need to let you go and do some rehearsing or whatever you were doing on a Saturday morning. Thank you so much for taking some time out and telling us about Boom Crash Opera. We will look forward to seeing you in our town, the beautiful city by the bay, on the first of March with nineteen. 19- 27 and between now and the end of the show I'll find out where we can find tickets and uh, we'll get people along. Thanks guys great to chat. Hope you enjoyed that coffee Peter. Best wishes.